And now, please welcome the Executive Director of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, Julie Packard. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here. It was not an amazing performance. Wow, what a day. What a way to start the day. So during a momentous two days of very important climate conversations, today and this morning is especially significant to me. We're going to dive into the impact that climate change is having on the health of the global ocean, which, of course, as we know, is the largest ecosystem on our planet. But more importantly, we're going to dive into how maintaining a healthy ocean is going to be absolutely key to the solutions to climate change and to meeting the goals that we've set for ourselves here. For the first time, ocean issues are getting the attention they deserve here at this conference. So as a California native and head of an organization that inspires millions of people every year by connecting them with ocean life, uh, I'm well aware, as all of you are, that the ocean has got to be central to the climate conversation. Human health depends on the health of our ocean and the life-giving services that it provides. Around the world, as we all know now, people depend, absolutely depend, on the food and jobs and transportation, uh, that, and most importantly, the services to stabilize our climate that the ocean provides. Unfortunately, at our peril, and we've heard a lot about that um, over the past couple of years, we have ignored the ocean and the impacts from our unchecked production of greenhouse gases. Sea levels rising, placing millions of people at risk around the world, and I'm not even going to include the specifics on that because we are seeing them on the news every day and as we speak. We've got to act as if our lives depended on it, because they do. There is some good news, I'm here to say. I guess my job at this point in life is to try to be the optimist, and I am. I mean, I'm so inspired by the commitments that have been made by countries and states and cities around the world. Uh, and the good news, as far as the ocean is, it is resilient. It can recover. We've seen that. But it needs our help. So the even better news is we know what to do to make that happen. We're already seeing progress in public policy and from the business community here in California and around the world. We're building a clean energy future that's going to sustain all of us and help maintain the healthy ocean to continue to let life exist. So today's sessions are going to take us to the next step. You'll hear a call to action to government industry and global citizens to safeguard the living ocean, to ensure the ocean can continue to provide the life-giving services that support seven and a half billion of us. Bold leadership is going to determine how quickly we can make progress on today's call to action. So we're asking everyone here to fire up and really dedicate action and follow through. The West Coast of the United States, like so many coastal territories, um, represented here has shown amazing leadership on this uh, mission to turn things around for our planet and advance solutions to global climate change, which really is the challenge of our lifetimes. So it's my great pleasure to introduce one of those leaders, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State. Thank you, Jay. Uh, good morning. What a delight to join you here to talk about the need for the world to have an aha moment when it comes to ocean acidification and, and, and uh, temperature changes in our oceans. I want to talk about just two of my aha moments. Uh, about 10, 12 years ago, I became intensely interested in climate change, and I was comforted in my ignorance in the knowledge that carbon dioxide that we pumped into the atmosphere by the gigatons went into solution into the waters, and I was always thinking, this is a wonderful thing. We're getting this CO2 out of the atmosphere and getting rid of it in the oceans. And then I went to a dinner with an oceanographer named uh, Ken Caldera at Stanford, who came down and said, you know, it's really cool that we're getting CO2 out of the atmosphere, but you know what happens when it goes in the ocean? It creates acidic conditions. And he gave me a 10-minute tutorial on that. And my jaw just dropped to the, to the floor when I heard this because the consequences were instantly recognizable to a guy who only had, you know, freshman biology. That was an aha moment for one member of the U.S. Congress, 
And ever since then, I've dedicated pretty much every day to doing something about ocean acidification. And isn't it great that we got a community today in San Francisco going to do everything humanly possible to defeat ocean acidification? I'm very appreciative of everybody being here. Here's my second aha moment. It has more to do with temperature than acidity. I was in La Push, Washington, which is a really active fishing community a while back, and I noticed these beautiful fishing boats all tied up to the dock. And I love fishing boats, but I don't like them when they're all tied up to the dock and they can't go fishing. These are my family members. My dad's best friend had the Shirley Ann that can't go fishing because of the blob and the ocean temperatures that shut down fishing in the northwest coast. Another aha moment. So now it is clear that we've got to do three things. Number one, all of us in the climate change community have to embed ocean acidification and ocean temperature changes into our daily messaging. Every day we get up and we brush our teeth. Every day most of us comb our hair. And every day we've got to figure out this is a central message to the world community. And this remains a fundamental precept in our success on this. Because I've taught legislators who still don't understand this concept. I talked to someone in San Francisco who's helping on climate change who really was not was formed to this concept. We need to embed this in our, in our messaging about what's happening to the death of the, of the Great Barrier Reef, what's happening to our oyster industry where we can no longer grow baby oysters in Puget Sound. We have to put a bicarbonate of soda in the water or the baby oysters cannot propagate because of the changes to the calcium carbonate systems in their precious little bodies. That's number one. Number two, I would encourage everyone to get their uh, 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 organizations to join our international alliance against ocean acidification. We now have 65 uh, groups, including some national groups, including France and Fiji. We would like to grow this alliance. Please join this alliance. There is powers in numbers, and this will help elevate the message and help us share our opportunities going forward as an international alliance. And number three, I just want to report to you about the things we are doing in the state of Washington as an exemplar of things that we can do. First, we started this alliance to start this international uh, effort. But we're doing things locally in the state of Washington to address this issue. Number one, we talk about it all the time, following principle number one. And number two, we're putting some money behind some efforts to deal with this. We're investigating uh, the efforts to reduce acidity by growing kelp and doing some uh, efforts in the biological system to try to reduce acidity. Can we even temporarily sequester carbon and reduce acidity even on a local basis? We've got several million dollars going into research in that regard. We're trying to help our shellfish industry deal with this issue by doing new research to figure out how they can adopt this issue. And we're making sure that every person who loves crabbing in the state of Washington understand there, there, not be very, there won't, won't be very good crabbing a century from now if we don't get on top of this session. So we're making investments in the things that can actually mitigate some of the harms on a local basis. But we know that there's only one ultimate solution to this, and that's the solution of growing clean energy jobs across this planet. And I'll tell you this, it's pretty good to know that clean energy jobs today, which are anti-ocean acidification uh, jobs, which are anti-blob jobs, are today growing twice as fast as the rest of the United States economy. That's something to celebrate. The ocean acidification community is a job-creating community and a job-saving community in the fishing industry, in the shell fishing industry, in the oceanic recreation uh, industry, and I'm glad to be involved in yet another economic development program, and that's what we're doing right here. Now, there's a lot of champions here today. There's one in the backstage. I just want to have a call out for the person who recently has done most against ocean, ocean acidification in America, and that's uh, Secretary John Kerry. Can we give him a round of applause for the work he's done in Paris? Paris was an ocean acidification treaty as much as a climate change treaty, and I appreciate his work. We have two champions from the Polynesian canoeing a community that are now sailing a, a canoe from Hawaii to demonstrate commitment to oceanic cultures. Nainoa Thompson 
and Lehua Kamalu are here today. Let's welcome them and let's save their cultures. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Aloha mai kako. Um, my name's Nainoa, and I'm from the Hawaiian Islands in the middle of the Pacific. Um, we are also from the biggest nation on Earth, called Polynesia, 10 million square miles, larger than Russia. And if you look at the map of Hawaii and Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Rapa Nui, the triangle, um, it's 10 million square miles, bigger than Russia. It's three times the size of the continental United States. If you exclude for a moment the land mass of New Zealand and you add, up, you add up all the total square miles of all the islands in Polynesia, um, even though we're three times the size of the continental United States, you can fit us in one third the state of New York. I come from an ocean country. I come from an ocean ancestry. And we, uh, we're here to honor and to thank and to celebrate the vital important work of, of this summit. Uh, frankly, because our lives depend on it. The direct relationship between the health of the ocean, the direct relationship between our lives and how we live our lives, our history, our heritage, and the future of our children. Uh, your work is vital to us. And um, so in that celebration, we have been sailing, voyaging canoes for 43 years. We've been around the earth once. We have about 200,000 miles behind us. Um, we do it initially was to find and restore and rediscover our ancestry, our genealogies, and the ancient ways of the traditions of deep sea voyaging and, and traditional non-instrument navigation. And, um, and uh, when we looked at what you're doing, we would hope in some way that we could do something that would strengthen you that would uh, allow us to be a part of you. So we made a special voyage um, on one of our voyaging canoes called Hiki Analia, which is sister to our first voyaging canoe, Hokulea. And um, we chose to come here for a number of reasons, but to be here, to be active and, and part of this movement, this extraordinary room with powerful people making vital decisions that will impact all of us, especially our children. And so we, on dawn, on Monday morning, uh, the voyaging canoe, Hikyanali, arrived to Half Moon Bay to be here. And um, it was 2,900 miles of sailing. Uh, it took us halfway to the North Pole from the equator. Um, and it was uh, sailed in the old way, following the stars. Um, that if you can imagine that this crew that sailed, our navigators will make 5,000 observations of nature. You only know where you are by memorizing where you come from. There you have to be awake, and there you have to pay attention to stars, moon, planets, wind, clouds, oceans, waves, and life in the sea. Our navigators will make 500 choices about trim, steering, weight and balance, everything. And then they'll make two decisions in a day, at sunrise and sunset. Where are you? And where are you going? It's uh, vital choices of our time. And so I'm honored to, um, I flew on Hawaiian Airlines, it took me four and a half hours. It took them, 20, <laughs> it took them 23 days. And uh, I'm gonna introduce to you our lead navigator and captain of Hikianalia, Lehua Kamalu. Aloha, everyone. Sorry, my voice is a bit full of salt and wind and a little bit of cold. Um, but I, I was asked to share a bit about the experience of sailing here and taking that 23-day journey. The first question everyone asks is, why would you take 23 days 
when you could take four and a half hours. Um, and I think there's a very simple answer to that in that the journey is really the most important part for us, how we go about each day, how we go from one point to another is just as important as where you end up. And so this being my first, my longest um, voyage as captain and navigator, um, as the captain and navigator on a voyaging canoe, you don't sit in a chart house and sort of just give instructions on where we're gonna go and have a helmsman steer you that way. Um, it is your duty to make sure that the entire canoe is healthy from beginning to end. And so whether or not you are down there checking to see if the drinking water is still safe, if you have enough food for everyone, how long you can take this journey, if something is a little too risky for your team. Um, these are all decisions you're making each day. I had an amazing group of navigators that were training on this voyage that took 23 days and over 2,800 miles. And each one of them not only needed to know that you are there to make sure they're gonna be healthy and safe, because that's just surviving. What I really wanted when we came in uh, to California and landed there in Half Moon Bay was that they would be thriving. And I think the best way I could do that was to teach them how to understand what I was looking at. And if they knew the same things that I could see, that the wind was gonna change, or that there would be a star that would give them a sign, um, it gave them the confidence and the strength to trust what they had been studying and what they had been training to do for all these years. And so I hope that through this voyage, we were able to act on what we saw. When I, I was told we were going to the Climate Action Summit, uh, everyone said, well, what is that? I said, well, I think it's about action. I think it's about doing something. And uh, I was well, like, well, what are we doing? Uh, well, we're sailing across the ocean, but that's what we do. And I think through that practice, we learn to be connected to the ocean, to everything that's in it, uh, to the fish that feed us, to the wind that powers our sails, and to the signs that guide us from one place to another. And through that, I think every one of these crew members that sailed in, unfortunately they weren't able to be here, have learned what it means to take action each day to live a healthy and thriving life with the people and the place around you. And, uh, that's, that's really what that experience is, and we hope that uh, actually we'll be arriving on Sunday for a larger arrival where you will be able to meet those crew if you, if you like. Um, but that's our action, and, and we hope through continuing to do this and continuing to share that story um, that that can be a guide if someone else might be looking for something that can connect them to the sea and to the ocean around them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I realize actually not everyone gets to be out in the middle of the ocean seeing um, the beautiful water and the fish, but also some of the things that are not so beautiful about the ocean that hopefully we're gonna start turning the tide on. Um, and so we wanted to just introduce uh, a video that was created to share some of the many complex ways that the ocean affects our lives. And that even though you might not be on the deck of my canoe or on the shores of Hawaii observing it each day, the ocean is all around us in everything that we do and see. And, uh, and we can all play a part in protecting it and keeping it wonderful and beautiful for every generation to come. So I think we have a short video now to play for you.
Life began in the ocean. And the ocean has sustained life ever since. It provides us with food, oxygen, and fresh water, the riches with which we have built civilizations. The ocean connects all things, earth to atmosphere, continents and cultures. The ocean controls and stabilizes our climate. It absorbs one quarter of the carbon we emit burning fossil fuels and stores 90% of the sun's heat on our warming planet. It distributes that heat around the world through ocean currents, moderating temperatures, maintaining favorable conditions for life everywhere. But for too long, we have taken the ocean for granted. Acting as though its resources were infinite, its systems immutable. We have pushed past its limits. Now, the ocean is starting to falter. Its water heating and acidifying its corals bleaching, its islands drowning, its fish stocks in decline. And yet, we rely on the ocean now more than ever to guard humanity against climate change itself. We must help the ocean heal. That means turning away from dirty fuels and toward the abundant, renewable energy nature bestows. We must also protect the ocean's ability to store carbon dioxide. We can do this by nurturing the rainforests of the ocean, habitats that capture carbon and also help protect coastal communities and by preserving the foundation of the ocean's food web, the organisms that help transport carbon to the deep sea. The ocean can use its enormous power to cleanse and regenerate itself if we only give it a chance. By fishing sustainably and creating protected zones where life can flourish and adapt to the changing climate and by using science to continue unraveling the ocean's secrets. Because if we truly understand and respect it, the ocean will help us safeguard all life on Earth. Thank you again for bringing the oceans to the priority in the climate discussions. It's my great pleasure to um, introduce um, what I think is uh, the 21st century's world's great navigator for taking the blue planet to a healthy place, 68th Secretary of State John Kerry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Nainoa, Lehua, thank you for an extraordinary lesson uh, in the context of 21st century demands and challenges, and thank you all for the opportunity to share a few words with you. Uh, 
I want to start uh, by, well, first of all, I think Sigourney has, has really, uh, in the context of that video, described major parts of the challenge of the oceans. So I'm not going to repeat everything that she said, but let me just begin, if I can, by thanking the Global Action, the Global Climate Action Summit for bringing together so many thoughtful, uh, important people with respect to the challenge that we face from so many different industries in order to discuss the options for where we proceed. Uh, I want to thank Julie Packard, uh, who has in many ways spent her life addressing this issue. Um, and thanks in large part to her engagement and to the creative leadership uh, of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, that aquarium and her efforts have become primary in what we're trying to do here. More than 45 million people have visited the aquarium, uh, and the millions of visitors who walk through that aquarium aren't just tourists, they've become activists because they get engaged and they begin to understand what, what we're facing here. Now, folks, I, I want to just be uh, pretty blunt and direct here today. I don't want to be the skunk at a garden party, but I also, uh, also it's important that we deal with the truth. I don't want to be political, I'm not going to be, I'm not pessimistic because every challenge that we face in this arena is solvable, but I am going to tell the truth. And the truth is we are not anywhere near where we need to be with respect to the overall challenge of climate change and even the challenge of the oceans. I uh, had the enormous both pleasure and challenge and privilege it really was a privilege to be able to lead the negotiations in Paris and work for four years, actually for a lifetime, for my 28 years in the Senate with Al Gore and Tim Wirth and John Warner and a whole bunch of us who have been committed to this for a long time. And, and the Paris Agreement really wasn't written overnight. It was written as a product of decades of negotiations and lots of failures. As, as George Mitchell once said, you know, negotiating is 700 days of failure and one day of success, the day you get it done. And that's how you have to go at this. But the Paris Agreement began really when we went to China. I went to China in the, in the first six weeks of being secretary, and we changed the dynamic of the failure of what had happened in Copenhagen, where we just failed. The international community failed. And we all remember the disaster of China and the G77 going off in a corner and President Obama having to basically chase them and force a meeting to try to even get some kind of communique that made sense. So went to China, met with President Xi, and we created a, a working group with the intention of being able to announce our mutual uh, reductions and emissions together in order to send a different signal. And one year later, President Obama and President Xi did indeed stand up in Beijing, and we announced the intended reductions of China and the United States together, and said, together, we're going to go to Paris and we're going to make that a success. Well, within months or weeks, Europe followed. Others began to follow. And indeed, we were able to meet in Paris, almost 200 nations strong, in order to define common but differentiated responsibility in a different way for the first time. We almost balked, but in a late night meeting, we managed to bring some of the reluctant parties on board to join into the effort. And, and there's a reason I mention this in the context of what is happening on the oceans, because we, uh, we, we uh, came out of Paris, ultimately, as you all know, with the Paris Agreement, which was an acceptance by each and every nation to do what it could. It wasn't close to what we tried to do in Kyoto, and I remember trying to manage the Kyoto agreement on the floor of the Senate, and we couldn't get anything. Robert Byrd and West Virginia and Cole and all these people resisted anything happening because China and the others weren't doing anything, let alone enough. So we managed to come together and create a structure, and now we have a president who without any knowledge of the issue, without any scientific fact whatsoever, lying to the American people about a burden to the United States, which is not a burden at all, 
because no country accepted to do anything in Paris that was not within the capacity of that country to achieve. And the fact is the burden is not responding. Three storms, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, cost $265 billion. That's one-third of the Defense Department budget. It's more money than we put in to the Energy Department, the Commerce Department, the Education Department, and three or four other departments put together. That's a burden. And so for the President to stand up in front of the American people and say, it's too much burden, we have to get out of Paris and withdraw American leadership from an issue that is life or death is the, one of the single greatest acts of irresponsibility by President of the United States anywhere at any time. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. It's not going to be news to you. I think everybody's beginning to learn it. But the American people are way smarter than this president. And that's why, that's why, that's why 38 states in the United States of America, under the leadership of people like Jerry Brown and Jay Inslee, who was just here, and other governors and mayors all across our nation, they have been able to take a stand. Those 38 states have renewable portfolio standards that uh, are mandatory. Uh, 29 of them, I think, are mandatory. Eight of them are, are voluntary. But guess what, folks? That's 80% of the American population that is committed to continue to try to meet the goals that we set in Paris. And what's so damning about this is that we knew, and I said in Paris at the end of the, when we passed it, that we're not leaving Paris, and we didn't leave Paris, knowing that we had a guarantee that we're keeping the rise of the Earth's temperature to two degrees centigrade. We knew that. That's the goal. But we left Paris sending the most important signal we've ever sent to the private sector, that all of these 196 countries are going to try and do this for the first time. And that signal worked. Because last year, the year before, $358 billion went into alternative, renewable, and sustainable energy. For the first time ever, we spent more money investing in alternative, sustainable energy than in fossil fuels. So the signal was sent. Oh, you can clap. It's all right. But the danger, here's the danger. The danger is that not that we won't get there at some point in time. The danger is we're not going to get there in time. That's the reality as we sit here today in San Francisco and as people go about their business in the United States of America and around the world. We have 200 gigawatts of coal-fired power plants coming online with another 450 gigawatts planned. China, which is currently leading with quotes around it on the issue with respect to solar and other issues because the United States has retreated as an administration, uh, is the worst offender, I regret to say. But one of the, I won't go into all the problems of that, and, and you've got India close behind and then Russia and Indonesia and other countries. So folks, it's just not gonna work if that's where we are. What we need to do I mean, we, had, we made a commitment to $100 billion to the Climate Fund in Paris. $10 billion was actually pledged. Only $3 billion has been paid. $1 billion came from the United States of America, which we managed to slip in in the Obama administration before we left, and therefore it's in the budget. And President Trump has promised that we won't spend one dime more. Let me tell you what a president ought to be doing. A president ought to be convening the G20, locking the doors of the room and making it clear nobody's going to leave until $100 billion is in the bank and we're helping small nations transition without having to build coal-fired power plants. We shouldn't build one more coal-fired power plant in the world. Now, oceans, which are key to this. Oceans have been part of my life since I was, I mean, obviously since I was a kid, about three years old, and dipped my toes into 
Buzzards Bay in Massachusetts and went clamming and sailing. My dad actually is a great sailor. He sailed across the ocean in a 39-foot boat three times. Uh, and, and so I, I have a passion for the ocean. So much so that I started a series of conferences called Our Oceans Conference. We did the first one in Washington, the second one, the Chileans stepped up and they took it on. The third one, we did again in Washington before we left. We had what we called the Billion Dollar Panel, where Julie Packard, on behalf of the Packard Foundation, committed $550 million over five years in order to try to have enforcement and deal with more research and help to protect the oceans. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation committed 250, the Walmart Foundation 220. We raised a billion dollars in one single panel in order to try to protect the oceans. But, and then, and then the next year, Malta did it just last year. Uh, this year, we're going to Bali in a few weeks for the next round of the Oceans Conference. Norway will do it next year. And guess who's doing it after that? Russia wants to do it. People are understanding that vast as the oceans may be, powerful as they are, all the poetry and all the literature that's been written about the oceans, they are vulnerable. And we're killing them with trash, with plastic, with pollution, with runoff, with development, with overfishing. A third of all the fisheries in the world are already overfished. The others are almost at maximum. We have too much money chasing too few fish. I mean, this may sound funny to you, but 450 million Chinese have come in from poverty to the middle class. And they now have discovered blue tuna and sushi. Guess what happens? Illegal fishing. Ted Stevens and I years ago took illegal fishing and drift nets to the United Nations. They banned them. But we still have renegade pirate fishermen who go out there from particularly some Southeast Asian and North Asian countries, and they strip mine the ocean. And two-thirds of that fishing catch is thrown overboard. Thrown overboard. We live in an ecosystem. The president doesn't seem to understand what that means an ecosystem where each part is dependent on the other. The ocean is the greatest sink there is on Earth for CO2. But a few years ago, scientists noticed that a certain portion of CO2 was being regurgitated down in Antarctic. The oceans are critical to the flow, to the, to the movement of climate. The Nino, El Nino, El Nina, all of these things matter. Some scientists have even prognostified that maybe we could lose the Gulf Stream that the oceans could change because the water temperature is changing. The water temperature is what is contributing to all these storms. Their intensity, they come at us faster. More fires. We'll have refugees in the world. We'll have food production interrupted. This is just logic, logical. We're living in a very strange world, folks, where logic doesn't have the impact it used to have, where facts, you can't even build in our political structure a basis of what is a fact. Two and two is four, four and four is eight. But Rudy Giuliani can step up and say the truth is not the truth. Please. We, we've got, you know, just the other day, InfoWars issued a big news alert that the hurricane lane that was heading towards Hawaii had been split in half by an energy bolt from Antarctica fired by me. I mean, how screwed up can you be? I fired it from the North Pole. What's going on? I mean, ladies and gentlemen, I've been to Paris, I've been to Buenos Aires, I've been to Poland, I've been to Pasta, I've been to Copenhagen, I've been to Rio. For years, we've all been there. We need to translate this felt need, this known need, this scientific fact, into unparalleled political action. The first thing that I did, and I just, I say this to you, I don't, I don't want to politicize this, but it matters. In 1970, when I first came back from Vietnam, I didn't protest the war at first, I protested what was happening in the environment. Rachel Carson had inspired us, early 1960s. And so 20 million Americans came out of their homes on the first Earth Day. And that was translated into a political movement where those 20 million, we targeted the 12 worst votes in the United States Congress. And in the next election, 1972, seven of the 12 were defeated. 
And I will tell you, as a 28-year veteran of the United States Senate, there is nothing like massive defeat for elected officials on a particular issue to stiffen the spine of the survivors. That's how it works. So, I, I, I'm, I'm just telling you the truth. I know this isn't a political rally or anything, but I'm telling you the truth. If we don't, if we don't hold people accountable for turning their backs on responsibility, if we don't hold people accountable who raise their hand and take an oath to uphold the Constitution, but they're more interested in upholding their power and the president and a party, we're not being responsible citizens. We have to actually vote, and we have to vote about specific issues. And the magic number is 54.2. That's the percentage of eligible Americans that voted in 2016. When Barack Obama won in 2008, it was 62.3% of eligible voters. That's the story of where we are today. We need to get that $100 billion for the Clean Climate Fund. We need to get Americans and people all around the world to understand this is a race against time. This is a matter of survival. The ocean is where life comes from. That's what Sigourney just said, and she's right. And today, over 50% of our oxygen, about 51%, comes out of the ocean. But if we pollute it to death, if we diminish the amount of phytoplankton, if we kill off those plants with the chlorophyll that, that produce that oxygen, we are killing ourselves. So we need to make a guarantee that out of San Francisco, out of these meetings, comes not just the agreement of how good it is we're pursuing battery storage, or how good it is that we're moving down the road with respect to you know, one initiative or another in the states. We have to make it clear that we're going to hold ourselves accountable to make our own democracy work again. And, 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 and the best thing I can say to you is this, in terms of that. Because of those 38 states, because of Governor Inslee, Governor Brown, and, and Governor Cuomo, and Governor Baker in my state and others, we're still fighting for common sense. And the fact is that uh, those states are going to continue to pursue the Paris, the Paris levels. And I can tell you today that while Donald Trump may have pulled out of the Paris Agreement, the American people have not. And that is a critical message. So, uh, everyone knows how climate change is already affecting us, and nowhere is, is it more impactful than the people of the Pacific Islands. Uh, they've experienced historic droughts, the highest rates of sea level rise in the world. A lot of people talk the talk. Uh, but uh, we have a fellow with us here today, the Prime Minister of Fiji, who uh, walks the walk, gets things done. Uh, Frank Banimarama, uh, was, his was the first country to ratify the Paris Agreement. Uh, and he has offered to give refuge to the people of uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu, uh, even as his own country is trying to take steps to relocate permanently because the places that they've called home for generations are now uninhabitable. And that is why, as president of COP23, he's called for a grand coalition and urged climate action and leadership at every single level in civil society, private sector, subnational governments, and, and, and we are profoundly grateful for that leadership. And it's my uh, privilege to introduce to you uh, Prime Minister Bani Marama. Thank you. Bulamnaka, ladies and gentlemen, and good off, good morning to you all. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for Fijians and for all the people who live in island states, the ocean is everything. It uh, envelops us, it sustains us, it defines and uh, inspires us, and it can also threaten us. It is our lifeblood and our highway. It is our playground and our vital uh, natural resource. Our Fijian flag 
takes its color from the blue of our beloved Pacific, to which we are intimately and permanently bound. In the Pacific, as we watch the sea steadily steal our lands, and as we foresee wetlands, atolls, and barrier islands disappearing beneath the waves, we are driven to fight for our homes. When the coral reefs we love and depend on start dying before our eyes, we cannot contain our anger and sadness. When traditional fish stocks flee from our waters, we fear for our future. And when we sit fully exposed and defenseless before category five cyclones with no landmass to serve as a break on the wind, we are frankly petrified. All of this is part of our daily life, especially if your home is a small island. So you can imagine, ladies and gentlemen, that when we uh, see that in some quarters there is no sense of urgency to solve this crisis, we feel betrayed. And yet we are determined not just to survive, but to fight and conquer. We have long known that the global ocean is perhaps the single most important factor influencing climate. We know that the ocean both reacts to and uh, influences climate-related events worldwide. It supplies nearly half the oxygen we breathe and absorbs over a quarter of the carbon dioxide we produce. Our oceans would be in trouble even if the world's climate was not changing from overfishing, pollution, acidification, and the sheer weight of human exploitation. But the interaction of ocean ecology and climate change is so profound uh, and so intimate that we cannot attempt to solve the crisis of one without confronting the crisis of the other. We see it as a great opportunity, and we are grateful to have found a generous and willing partner in the government of Sweden to pursue this opportunity. We chaired last year's United Nations Ocean Conference together, and we launched the Ocean Pathway Partnership. The Ocean, uh, Ocean Pathway Partnership will ensure that oceans are an integral part of the UNFCCC process by 2020. We are already well on the way to that goal, as evidenced by the many nations that have joined us, island nations and uh, continental nations such as Norway, Mexico, and Chile, and the recent Friends of the Ocean discussions at the Bangkok Climate Conference. We also have the advantage of a number of uh, complementary and reinforcing initiatives that can form a critical mass of support and more importantly, action. That is why I'm pleased to recognize and support the Ocean Climate Action Agenda presented today. The Ocean Climate Action Agenda and other initiatives all serve to make the Ocean Pathway Partnership stronger by mobilizing governments at every level, civil society, business, and ordinary people. We truly are seeing a grand collision forming around the need to commit ourselves to the health of our, uh, health of our oceans. That is because the ocean starts the lives of nearly everyone on earth in some way, even people who have never known the joy of inhaling fresh sea air. And this is a very good thing. Ladies and gentlemen, last year at the United Nations uh, General Assembly, I said that climate change challenges us to re redefine what we mean by national interests. Is it not in every nation's interest and every person's interest to preserve the health of our oceans? Our oceans have adapted to human activity, but there is a limit to what the oceans can take. If our oceans can adapt, should we expect less of our energy sector and manufacturing sector? should we expect less of ourselves? 2018, ladies and gentlemen, is the year of the Talanoa. All around the world, people are coming together under this specific concept of respectful and blameless engagement to speak honestly and openly about the success and challenges, to share ideas and solutions, and to learn from the stories of others. This process should make us more accountable and more committed and should ultimately help every nation raise its ambition to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions as expressed in our nationally uh, determined contributions. We know that the commitments we have made so far are inadequate 
and we must attack the causes of climate change more aggressively and with more dedication. The task before us now is to harness the energy of the global Talanoa and channel it, uh, channel it into a strong political outcome at COP24 in Poland, one that declares that we as one world are serious about confronting climate change. To all of you who have championed the cause of our oceans, I now want to commit to action on what I hope you won't mind me calling my ocean the Pacific Ocean. Fiji will take the lead by strengthening our NDCs to take action on the ocean uh, climate action agenda. And on behalf of the people of Fiji and all Pacific people, I want to challenge the nations, states, cities, and communities that border the global oceans to make the same commitment. In the end, we need truly ambitious actions on every shore across the planet if we are going to arrest the warming of our planet and the degradations of our oceans. We cannot hold back one ounce of energy. Yes, we must take stock, but we must also take action together as a global community to respond to this crisis. And when we do, saving the oceans will be at the top of the list. Thank you. Please welcome National Geographic photographer, Christina Metermeyer. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Pretty amazing group of people here. And this morning, I was going to give you this peppy talk about you know, how amazing photography is. But I thought that instead, we might reflect just for a moment on the people that are facing hurricanes and cyclones this morning, the ravages of climate change as we sit here today. So let, let's take stock of that for just a second. I was going to tell you all about the amazing journey of becoming a National Geographic photographer. I wanted to be a marine biologist when I started my career. It turned out that was not my calling. I wanted to be just like Rachel Carson and Sylvia Earle and Jay Blachenko, but that's not what was for me. Instead, I learned how to use a camera, and not just to take pictures. The images you see behind me have been taken over 25 years of roaming some of the most remote corners of our planet to try to bring the story of our oceans to big audiences. And what we're learning is how to mobilize large groups of people through social media. Through my organization, Sea Legacy, and with the support of National Geographic, we can mobilize hundreds of thousands of people to become citizens of the ocean. Just yesterday, we delivered 200,000 signatures to the International Whaling Commission to say, as our oceans struggle, it makes no sense to continue commercial whaling. We hope they'll pay attention. It is really fun to take photographs of beautiful animals, indigenous people. And while they're beautiful and hopefully they're inspiring and hopefully they invite a conversation, they're not always uh, what people want to see. Last year, while I was traveling through the Arctic, I came upon a polar bear that was starving. You'll see the picture here in a second. I didn't realize when I posted that photograph um, on social media the impact it was going to have. As the image started traveling through Instagram, Facebook, people sharing it on Twitter, the media started picking it up. In the end, it was published by 300 newspapers around the world, and it was seen by two and a half billion people. It was not without controversy. People wanted to know why I didn't save the polar bear, why I didn't feed it, why I didn't put a blanket over its shoulders. And it really is hard to explain to people how animals in remote places can struggle. In the end, for me, regardless of what caused this animal to suffer, I wanted this to be an invitation for people to imagine what climate change is going to do to wildlife, what it's going to do to us. Two and a half billion people stopped for just one second to think about climate change. And that, to me, was a big achievement. It became the most widely shared story of climate change in 2017, and it showed me a really important lesson there's a big audience of people out there who still don't believe that climate change is real. So I would like to invite our panel this morning to help us explore the links between ocean and climate change. Please welcome my friend, Dr. M. Sanjan, CEO of Conservation International. <laughs> Dr. Jane, Dr. Jane Lubchenko, the former administrator of NOAA. I call her a global ecologist for the ocean. 
His Honor Ambassador Mesharia Kamau. He's the Principal Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Kenya. And finally, my friend Sila Watt Coulter. She is an ambassador from the people of the North. She is an Inuk person, and she uh, is a senior fellow of the Center for International Governance Innovation. Please sit down. Good morning. I want to begin this conversation by inviting each of you to give me just a two-minute overall um, statement of what you've been up to, uh, how you're thinking about oceans and climate change. <laughs> Starting with me? Starting with you, Sanjin. Uh, good morning, and, and you, you know the facts already. Uh, thanks for having us all here. Um, the speakers before us, uh, Prime Minister Fiji, um, Secretary Kerry and others were just incredibly eloquent, and your photos <laughs> just sort of brought that to the audience here. Here's what I would, I would say to you. There is an absolute moment right now where the world's attention on the oceans is getting focused. You can see it, you can see it in the media, you can see it on the, on the front lines of the newspapers. There is this push right now. The challenge is, there isn't that much concrete action that's behind that interest. You know, plastics has caught everyone's attention, overfishing is catching everyone's attention, the whaling issue is catching everyone's attention. You've got two and a half billion people stopping for a second to go, wow, this is insane. What do we do? So one of the things that we have been very excited about is this idea of blue carbon. So it turns out that certain oceanic habitats, like mangroves and seagrass beds, can just store carbon better than basically any other habitat on Earth. You know, four to ten times more carbon can be stored in mangroves underwater. Fast growing, they protect communities, they're great for fisheries, they're great for people, they're good at protecting you from storms, and the huge carbon sinks. So one of the things I'm excited about this conference is yesterday we announced a partnership with Apple, uh, where Apple has helped us protect, working with communities, about 30,000 um, acres of mangroves off the coast of Colombia. To put that in perspective, in the lifetime of that project, that's about one million tons of carbon taken out of the atmosphere or sequestered. So that opening of that market for blue carbon gives us one positive way in which companies, governments, businesses, individuals can actually change the thermostat of the planet in our own lifetimes. And that's the trick. I've got no time to waste for my grandkids. I don't have any kids, but I don't have <laughs> any time to wait for your grandkids. We've got to do it in my lifetime now when we're still working, when we are still having a pulse. So that's what I'm excited about today, and I urge all of us, and I all of you, to use this moment of attention to do something. Jane. Thanks, Christina. Isn't the ocean amazing? I find it endlessly fascinating, as do my grandkids. And as a scientist, I understand how vital the ocean is to everyone on Earth. The ocean sustains us, it feeds us, it connects us. It's our past and it's our future. And the ocean holds lots of secrets. Fortunately, scientists are beginning to unlock many of those secrets. And I'm here today to share a little bit about some of what we are learning. Make no mistake, the impacts of climate change on the ocean are already well underway. The ocean is higher, it's warmer, it's stormier, it's sicker, it's more acidic, it holds, I need another hand, less oxygen, and as a result of that, it is more disrupted and less predictable. Mm. Those eight things are a big, big problem for us and many, many creatures in the ocean. But it's not hopeless. The ocean is the key to mitigating and adapting to climate change. Marine protected areas, MPAs, and fishery reform are two prime examples that I'm excited about. Highly protected marine areas are one of the most powerful tools that we have to enhance the resilience of the ocean. If they are large 
and well-designed and well-protected, they can do a lot more than provide safe havens for wildlife. They can also capture and store carbon. They can restore ecological balance, protect coastal areas from storm surge and coastal erosion, protect the genetic diversity that is absolutely key to adaptation, help recover depleted fisheries, and that's pretty impressive, all of those together. Despite these fabulous benefits, though, we currently protect only 4% of the ocean. Compare that to the 15% that we protect on land. And only 2% of that is highly protected. Clearly, we have a very powerful tool that is just waiting to be deployed. Many countries are pushing actively with their commitments to protect over 10% of the ocean by 2020, which is a great start. But in reality, to really harness the power of MPAs, highly protected MPAs that we need, we need to protect at least 30% of the ocean by 2030. It's encouraging that there are some exciting projects underway, for example, Germany is proposing a 1.8 million kilometers squared, 1.8 million kilometers squared, that's five times the area of Germany in the Weddell Sea uh, in the Antarctic as a protected area. A key point here is that only highly protected areas provide the biodiversity and the climate adaptation benefits that we need. Minimally protected areas simply do not. In parallel to that, Reforming fisheries is essential if we want to protect food security and avoid the worst ravages of climate change on people. Because fisheries provide livelihoods to over 20%, uh, over 10% of the global population, and they provide protein for over 3 billion people. This is really an urgent and can be an overwhelming challenge. The good news is that recent research by Steve Gaines, uh, my colleagues at the Environmental Defense Fund and elsewhere, have found that improving fishery management could actually offset many of the negative effects of climate change. This is because climate change is altering both the productivity of the ocean as well as the location of many stocks. Fisheries could be reformed, they suggest, to fix not only current problems with fisheries, but also make those fisheries and their management more resilient in the face of climate change. Now, making those reforms is not going to be easy, but given the urgency of the problem, it seems like a no-brainer. The seafood industry is beginning to step up to the problem, cognizant of the challenges of climate change and worried about that for the future of their industry. They announced just last week 10 of the largest seafood companies, or the, the 10 largest seafood companies in the world, have worked together with scientists led by the Stockholm Resilience Center to create a new organization called CBOS, Seafood Businesses for Ocean Stewardship, in which they are committing to make their practices and policies more sustainable. So these two tools, highly protected marine areas and fisheries reform, are what ocean climate action looks like. What will that take? Leadership, science, finance, and courage. Let me close with this thought building on the fabulous remarks of everybody that we've heard this morning. Sea monsters have captured people's imaginations since time immemorial. Sea monsters, we now know, uh, well, they, they, they've been around forever. <laughs> we now know that we have created our own monster, and its name is climate change. It threatens our health, our food security, our economies, and our security. But this is not a fairy tale. 
in which a lone heroine comes in and saves the day. It's a real life story in which we need businesses, citizens, scientists, and governments working together to conquer this monster, to defang this beast, <laughs> and to harness its power. For sure. Now is the time for that to happen. To be sure, this is a very powerful monster, but adding powerful ocean climate action to efforts already underway is the secret ingredient that we need. Jane. Ocean climate action. Say it with me. Ocean, ocean climate, climate action. action. I didn't hear you. Ocean, <laughs> ocean climate, climate action. action. One last time. Ocean, ocean climate, climate action. action. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Jane. Thank you, Jane. Ambassador, can you tell us about what's happening in your region of the world? Absolutely. First of all, thank you very much for having us here. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I am from Kenya, uh, which is a little bit of a ways from here. <laughs> and um, it's been fascinating to see what I have witnessed in the last couple of days. I see um, in this audience a uh, good friend of mine, um, Ambassador uh, Thompson, who is the uh, Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General. He can tell you on oceans, and he can tell you that a few years ago, maybe about five years ago, we had no idea when we began mobilizing around this issue, particularly around the uh, sustainable development goals and the challenge that we need to put behind uh, building a safer, more prosperous world for all of us, that it would really catch on in the way in which it has, it has caught on and that the Paris Agreement would have been signed up and we'd all be aligned together to try to deal with this challenge of climate change. We never have imagined this. But here we are. Now, despite all the negatives that we've heard today about people who still don't seem to believe in climate change, I can tell you that where I come from, on the continent that I li live on, the reality of climate change is stark whether it is droughts, accelerated weather events, uh, floods, huge storms, um, you name it. And here we are talking about a continent that is Africa that is already challenged by poverty and underdevelopment. It has been a huge challenge for us. Moreover, we have committed ourselves to be part of this global effort to respond to climate change, despite our condition. And many African countries have already done their national uh, NDCs. They, they have already agreed on what they will commit their efforts to, to issues that have to do with adaptation, because after all, we cannot do too much mitigation because we are not part of the industrial system, the manufacturing system that has poisoned the oceans and that has created the horrible conditions in our atmosphere. We are victims of this. And yet, we recognize that we have to be part of that solution. Because if we are not, we ourselves are going to suffer even more because we don't have the technology or the other capabilities to be able to respond. So true. So here we are in a situation where we have been putting together response programs for coastal systems, mangroves as... Uh, Ambassador, I mean, uh, Dr. Sanjayan was saying, trying to see how we can play a constructive role in this struggle to deal with climate change, because it is so real, and it is presenting an existential threat to us. But what's the reality? You heard um, Senator Kerry say today that resources need to be put in place to ensure that poor countries are able to, re to maintain the path that is consistent with the trajectory of achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. Well, this isn't going to happen if the resources aren't there. Mm -hmm. The uh, global environmental facility needs to be funded in a way in which it can deliver 
and work with, with countries, poor countries, to deliver on those goals that we have set ourselves for the Paris Agreement. The Green Climate Fund needs to be funded fully, as again, Senator Kerry spoke to. And this is something I want to talk more about. The, and yet the lack this has not happened, you see. And we are saying that Africa is going to industrialize. Africa is going to build up its manufacturing capability. But it's going to use the old technologies that are no longer used anywhere in the world. And what's going to happen as a consequence? We are going to undo all the effort that you're putting into climate change because we're going to be forced by circumstances to use dirty technologies, technologies that are available to us. And that is why we in Kenya, for example, have decided to put together a conference on the blue economy to try to convince the world that we have to find a way to reconcile industrialization and manufacturing with conservation and prosperity of our planet. Mm -hmm. And this is coming up in November, and we invite all of you all to get out there and be with us. But this is a huge challenge for the world, because everything that you're doing might be outdone and you know, undone by what happens when Africa rises and many other poor countries in the global south rise. And um, <laughs> so true. And as we speak of the first victims of climate change, the people that are already feeling it, the people of the North, uh, Sheila, what mm -hmm. can you tell us? Yes. As an ambassador well, I, of the Arctic. I grew up, I was born in the Arctic, in the Eastern Arctic of Canada, and traveled only by dog team the first 10 years of my life. Didn't know any English until I was six years old when I started school. And so that's my humble beginnings. And so I remember a time when things were much more peaceful and much more grounded in our culture in ways that we lived very much sustainably. And so that's my humble beginnings. And it's from that place that I try to bring you the human face to the issue of climate change, to humanize the issue, which often is talked about so much in uh, economics and policies and science. But for me, to try to put the human face to this issue has always been a very daunting task because most people don't understand what is happening in the Arctic to the people, because the world has come to know the wildlife of the Arctic better than its people. Sometimes it's because of the, the big marketing that happens around products, uh, you know, the polar bear and seals frolicking around, drinking pop. Uh, you've all seen that, which is a very unlikely partnership because one is lunch. Um, and so, <laughs> But it works, and it sells. Um, but for us, it's about us on the ground. You know, we're already living a context of trauma, the historical traumas that very few people know about that our communities are faced with uh, over the years. And I'm not going to go into detail on, on all of those, but you can certainly read them in my book called The Right to be Cold. And so the issues are, are, are quite stark. We are a people who still hunt, Every day, we fish every day. We gather during the seasons. So we are still very connected to the land, to the waters, and to the ice. For us, the ice is our, our highways. It, 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 we travel to, to our hunting grounds, which is our environment, our, our supermarkets. It's our organic food that we go out to search. We love our land, we love the waters, the ice, and it feeds us culturally, emotionally, spiritually, and otherwise. And teaching wisdom from the land and the ice is really the hallmark of Inuit culture. That's who we are. Uh, but now, with, the, with, with what's happening, with the speed in which changes have happened, and on top of that, the environmental degradation that is happening, uh, we're, we're at the risk now of losing not only the ice, but the wisdom that comes with that will go as well. The traditional knowledge that it requires for us not just to survive the harsh cold that we live in, but to thrive in it as we have for millennia. We don't want to be just depicted as victims to uh, the onslaught of, of globalization mm -hmm. or the history of colonialism. We have much to offer to this world in terms of understanding sustainability. And so for, for me, it's about 
the world understanding those pieces at the human level and connecting on that human level that I think we're going to make headway a lot more than sometimes dry technical reports will. The ice is a huge part of our identity. It is our life force. And it is something that we knew to be as permanent as your mountains here and the rivers here in the south. And so for us, because it's about transportation and mobility, where it brings us out to places for our food source, it becomes an issue of safety and security, first and foremost, when the ice starts to go, when things become unpredictable. And so we're, we're now dealing with those kinds of issues where we have hunters falling through the thinning ice because the traditional knowledge is not as strong as it used to be because we can't read the conditions as well as we used to. And so that becomes an issue now. Um, and, and the land is, as I say, is our universities. This is where we train our younger generation for the challenges and opportunities of life. When you are waiting for the snow to fall and the ice to form and the winds to die and the animals to surface, you are being taught patience. That's a character skill that's important. You're being taught how to be bold under pressure, how to be courageous, how to be persistent, how not to be impulsive. And ultimately, we're trying to teach our children to have sound judgment and wisdom that allows for them to make the right choices to become the proficient providers and the natural conservationists on the land, but also to transfer those skills to the modern world and deal with stressors much better than we are doing. We are known to have the highest suicide rates in North America because of the rapid changes that have happened, but on top of that now, the onslaught of the second wave of tumultuous change, and that's climatic changes. And so we, the violence that has been inflicted upon indigenous communities, not just in the Arctic, but around the world, uh, at the human level now mirrors that violence we are inflicting upon our planet. Human trauma and planet trauma are one of the same. Mm -hmm. And we must understand that. Mm -hmm. Climate change is happening now, very quickly in the Arctic, and affecting every other part in the world. And it is because, after all, it is the cooling system for the planet, and that is breaking down. What happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. We know that. Mm -hmm. We know that the disasters around the world are a result of the Arctic melt. The connection is very strong, and it's there. Climate change isn't just about polar bears and ice. It really is about the health, the food security, the poverty issues, the human rights issues of the people of the Arctic, and it's going to affect even the global security issues as, as the Northwest Passage becomes ice-free, and more and more security issues are going to be there, and the potential for even further damage to the oceans of the Arctic are certainly there. So again, we don't want to be the victims. We don't want to go down as a footnote in the history of globalization. Thank we you, have a lot Sheila. to offer. We only have a couple of minutes left, yeah. and I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity. Um, Sanjan, I know that you have a lot to say, but if I ask you in one minute to, I mean, what do we need to succeed at this? <laughs> All right, so He's one very minute. succinct. <laughs> so I, I just leave you two things I'll offer. You know, I think that the amount of funding going into oceans is, is almost trivial. It's laughable. You know, we were just discussing backstage that the amount of private philanthropic money that goes into marine protected areas and sort of, you know, place-based conservation is less, less than the marketing budget for any Marvel movie that's out <laughs> there right now. Less than the marketing budget for a movie. We think about right? that. Huh? So it's just the orders of magnitude off the scale. Governments are starting to see it, but they need private money to make things happen fast. Believe me, I do not believe in a model of conservation that says you're going to take money from the rich to take it to places that doesn't have enough money, and somehow that's going to fuel it. But private philanthropy is absolutely essential to set up a system that can be ultimately sort of self-sustaining because people are protecting nature in their own enlightened self-interest. Right? That's how you use private philanthropy. But for that greasing, we just don't have it. We just don't have it. 
So we need order of magnitude at least more of, of private money, of, of, of corporate, corporate money that goes into ocean conservation because as you know, it survives, it, it sort of saves us all. I'd also say this, you know, for, you, know you sit here at this climate conference, you, you, it's very difficult to walk out of this thing without being totally depressed. It, it, it's true, right? So we all feel this. I was born on an island. I was born a stone throw away from the Indian Ocean in Sri Lanka. When I was born, my grandmother took me to a temple and the astrologer told my family that I would die by drowning. So for nine years, they kept me out of the ocean. They never let me go. So as a kid, like literally behind the bars, all my friends were in the water. I couldn't go in there. And then when I was nine, my mother broke with tradition and taught me how to swim, not in the ocean, but in a mining pit. And it's changed my life. I've, I've literally been in every ocean essentially on the planet. It just changed the trajectory of my life. Now, think about this. My mother had a choice. She could either basically do what has been predicted and say, it's all over, I'm going to keep this kid safe, or she could invest in my future and take that chance, even though we know what is written. And that decision is up to you. I bet if any of you asked the same question, you would say the same thing. Give my kid a chance to swim, right? Even if you know what was going to happen. That's the moment we're in right now. It's sink or swim, and sinking is not the option. It's so true. We have to share the last couple of minutes, but Jane, I wanted to ask you, um, we are seeing the dismantling of our institutions in this country, and as a former administrator of NOAA, if I gave you a magic mm. wand to rebuild it for the <laughs> 21st century, what does it need? So institutions really will be key, because the leadership, the science, the finance, uh, and the uh, courage to move ahead. But we need institutions that are flexible and adaptable because this is a changing world. So whether it's government institutions or partnerships or whatever, flexible institutions and the high seas are a classic example of where we need more leadership, more action, more science, more finance. The treaty negotiations that are underway right now for the High Seas uh, Treaty at the UN uh, with biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction are a prime example. We need that kind of leadership. We need people coming together and making things happen. What does Africa need, Sharia? Africa? <laughs> what we need to understand is that we're living on one planet. Hmm. It's not about Africa. It's not about North America, and it's not about the Arctic. We're living on one planet, and this planet is dependent on all of us getting our act together. And nothing that you do out here in North America is going to stop climate change unless the Pacific, the Arctic, Africa, Asia is in on the game. Mm -hmm. And it behooves all of us to recognize that it's going to have to work like this, this time round. Or else, indeed, without sounding like the doomsday artist, it is really going to be very difficult for all of us collectively. So this is the one challenge that isn't going to get done without all of us recognizing that we are one humanity on one planet. Mm -hmm. You like spend very little time in the Arctic, but I, I know that your people are scared for what's coming. Is there any hope? There's lots of hope. Uh, I wouldn't be here if I thought that there wasn't hope mm. in the work that is being done uh, together with the like-minded, the like-spirited that are really working hard on these issues. Uh, again, for me, uh, and I wanted to end with that earlier, is that the indigenous voices are very wise from around the world, the vulnerable peoples who are dealing with these issues on the ground. So for me, I think if you tap into that wisdom of people who understand and live sustainably and have done so for millennia, but because of the challenges that are happening, we live in poverty, we live in hunger, mm -hmm. but that's not who we are. That's not the essence of who we are. We are still connected to nature. We hunt, we fish, we gather, we're a community. So if you, if you solve the indigenous crisis, the vulnerables, you solve the climate crisis. And if you solve the climate crisis, you solve the economic crisis. And I think that's how it all relates and connects. And we have to think of, about that in those terms. That's so true. Beautiful.
I'm always excited when I am the most incompetent person on a panel. <laughs> Incredible knowledge. Please talk to all these people of the panel. As we close, I would like all of us to take one breath. Now let's take a second one. <laughs> that one came to you courtesy of the ocean. You think about that as you deliberate on our commitments. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. That way. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are so eloquent. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Please welcome the Secretary of the California Natural Resources Agency, John Laird. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. I'm John Laird, California Secretary for Natural Resources. And California is known around the world for its rich and beautiful coastline with its iconic beaches, rocky shores, and wetlands, and the highest levels of native species uh, rich across our state, and valuable ecosystem services for the state population and economy. However, a recent study released by the California State Coastal Conservancy and the Nature Conservancy has highlighted the urgent need to take action to protect coastal uh, ecosystems from the impacts of the rising seas. The study found that with five feet of sea level rise, 55% of coastal habitat area is highly vulnerable, along with 39 rare, threatened, or endangered species and 41,000 acres of public conservation lands. In response to this alarming finding, multiple local, state, and federal entities have been uniting around a vision to protect California's coastal habitat and ecosystems in a future with five feet of sea level rise. This concerted effort is part of the Hope for Coast campaign being led by the Nature Conservancy, which has been working with the state and local climate and coastal leaders to adopt the following vision for the state of California's coastal future. In science-guided collective action, we will maintain and enhance California's coastal habitats in the face of sea level rise, other climate change-induced challenges and development, ensuring a protected coast for future generations to enjoy, replete with as much or more habitat and wildlife, as well as social, economic, and recreational benefits as we have today. Today I am here with Lynn Scarlett, the Global Climate Lead for the Nature Conservancy, and a group of representatives from state agencies and local governments who have made their own commitments to advance this vision and are here to demonstrate their support. We have representatives right here from all of California's coastal agencies, the Ocean Protection Council, the State Coastal Conservancy, the California Coastal Commission, the State Lands Commission, and the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. These agencies have adopted resolutions or given their commitment to maintaining, protecting, and enhancing our coast. Their commitments include incorporating best available science and the value of natural habitats into decision making, supporting planning for sea level rise adaptation and implementation of adaptation strategies, and a commitment to using partnerships and collaboration to protect habitats. We also have joining uh, with us here Carmen Ramirez, the Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Oxnard, and Dave Pine, a supervisor from San Mateo County. These are some of the ways in which California is leading the way in taking action to address sea level rise and climate change. We hope that others in California will join us in this campaign to protect our coast and that others in the United States and across the world will be inspired to take similar action in their own communities to combat climate change and protect valuable coastal habitat. Together, we can both prepare for climate change and protect and even enhance our rich coastal habitats under rising sea levels. 
California is a case study for this, and we pledge stronger commitment across our state to do so. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I appreciate seeing there are a lot of non-Californians standing for that as well. Uh, I would now like to welcome to the stage uh, Gail Galley of Project Everyone. Gail. Hello. I'm not even American, as you'll quickly tell. Um, I run something called Project Everyone, which is a unit dedicated to promoting the UN's global goals. We promote all of the goals, but we're here in California specifically to look at goal 14, life below water, as a very grateful guest of Salesforce. Mark Benioff has allowed us to come here and bring together 50 technologists, creatives, and storytellers to do some sprints on what we can do uh, for ocean health and to achieve goal 14. And I'm really happy to announce today that we're launching a Making Waves coalition between some private sector players and some scientific partners to really make a dent in three areas. We're looking at education, how can we make World Ocean Day a global phenomenon with our young people all over the world. We're looking at citizen science, how can we enable every single person to play their part in ocean health, harnessing the finest technology. And the third one we're looking at is the intersection between the enormous coastal uh, tourist industry and the damage that's being done offshore in terms of coral reefs and mangrove uh, tree restorations. So the coalition is uh, a powerful coalition made of people like Google X, Mars, Salesforce, the Benioff Ocean Institute, and 2030 Vision. And I think by working together collaboratively in partnership, as I'm sure you all are here to do, we can make a real difference in achieving goal 14. So thank you for having a Londoner over here and enjoy the rest of your conference. Now, please welcome to the stage a great friend of the oceans, Senator Ben Schatz from the state of Hawaii. Aloha, everybody. I'm Brian Schatz, the senator from the state of Hawaii. Uh, and we are really pleased to make this announcement. You know, there are many reasons to be concerned about our oceans and the challenges of climate change, but there are also reasons to be optimistic. And one of them is the OA Alliance. Two years ago, when Secretary Kerry hosted the Our Ocean Conference at the State Department, a group of states on the West Coast announced that they were joining with the Canadian province of British Columbia and Ocean Conservancy to start an alliance focused on ocean acidification. Their goal was to motivate governments to do something by coming up with a plan for sustaining coastal communities and livelihoods. And today, the OA Alliance has grown from those five founders to more than 65 members. It includes national governments, the states of New York and California, tribal nations, cities, researchers, and NGOs. Together, members of the Alliance are taking steps to protect the health of the oceans and address the harm that ocean acidification causes in coastal communities. Because of their efforts, governments are making action plans, the international community is getting the push it needs to include strong ocean protection provisions in international climate agreements. And the issue is more prominent in public discourse and public policy development. Today, the Alliance's efforts become our efforts as well. I am proud to represent the great state of Hawaii and stand with delegates from the Netherlands, the state of Virginia, and the city of Seattle in joining the OA Alliance. Together, <laughs> together we commit to doing our part to help respond to the threat of ocean acidification within our region. Uh, to close the session, uh, that would have been awkward. Um, to close out the session, I want to share a quote from Daniel Hudson Berman, who was the father of city planning 
in the United States. And he said, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work. When I think of Berman's words, I think of the expansion of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. The monument was created by George W. Bush, who set aside 140,000 square miles of the Pacific Ocean. When I first came to the United States Senate, I realized that we had a chance for this monument to become a major part of our fight against climate change. And so we started to talk about expanding it. We spent months talking with local communities, especially native Hawaiians and local fishermen, to build support for the idea. And then in 2016, President Obama signed a proclamation expanding the monument from 140,000 square miles to 582,000 square miles. With this, with this monument, we did not make little plans. But to make a project of this scale work, we had to have three phases. First, we really had to start with community. Second, we had to execute. We had to get the papers signed. I was in Hawaii when President Obama flew home, gave a speech, and made it official. And of course, this is the moment that everybody remembers. There's a sort of iconic picture of President Obama on Midway, looking as happy as I think he's ever been, at least during his presidency. Um, <laughs> but that's really only part of the whole process. The third part is the hard part, because it's when we actually take care of the place. It's when we pull together the resources to make the mo monument not just a presidential document, but a real effort that addresses fishing and climate and strengthens the ecosystem that sustains biocultural resources. It's not easy to take 500,000 square miles and set it aside. It takes active management, it takes money for tech, money for research, money for fuel, conservation biologists and technicians. And that's what, make this, that's what makes this not just a feather in everyone's cap, but a real meaningful act. And that's exactly what we're beginning to do through a public-private partnership I want to tell you about. This year, I joined NOAA and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and Mark and Lynn Benioff in making a commitment to fund ongoing monitoring and research at the monument. This partnership will provide $1 million in funding to support the monument this year. And next year, the federal contribution is scheduled to double, leading the way for the partnership to continue to expand. This is how we're going to make real Papahanaumokuakea's promise of enforcement, management, research, and education. And it's just the beginning of a legacy of these 582,000 square miles. That's the number I want to leave you with, 582,000 square miles. Because it's time for us to start thinking in those terms, looking for solutions that meet the scale of the problem. We have to ask, what it would really take to save our oceans, not what it would be neat to do, not what can be done, not what is fundable, not what is scalable. Let's treat this like the planetary emergency that it is. We have ocean acidification, we have temperatures rising and fisheries declining. We have a future where plastics could outweigh biomass in the oceans by the year 2050. So we have to think on a scale of the planet itself. Let us make no little plans. Thank you. Aloha.